Welcome back to this week's GCN Tech Clinic. You know how this works by now. You comment underneath the videos with your questions, preferably using the hashtag AskGCNTech. I pick out those questions and then answer them as best as I can. That's enough jibber jabber from me. Let's go to our first question. So first in this week is a question from Cycling Thomas. They say, hey GCN, I do a lot of Zwift and probably do three races a week. Do you think I'll make better gains by racing or doing structured workouts? Thanks. I think it depends really what you're trying to achieve. If you're just trying to improve your ability of doing Zwift races, then like any skill, practicing it is gonna help improve your ability and how well you can do it. However, if you're just generally trying to improve your cycling ability as well as how well you can race in Zwift. I would suggest mixing it up slightly and doing a combination of Zwift workouts and the Zwift races. That way, I think you're covering all sorts of bases in doing some of those specifics and then getting stuck in to that racing, which we enjoy as well. So in my opinion, maybe mix it up each week, sometimes two races, sometimes one structured workout, and then other weeks you can do two workouts and one Zwift race. Just I think the easiest thing to do, in my opinion, is keep a, keep a mix and keep it fresh. So next question is from Paul Dawes. They say, hi team, I have my smart trainer set up undercover on the terrace this winter where it can get pretty cold. So there's no need for fans. Hmm, fantastic, that'd be great. Will freezing temperatures affect the long-term life of my trainer and slash or bike? Well, I don't think the cold or just the temperature in general is going to have any negative impact on the longevity of your bike or your trainer. However, the temperature does affect how accurately the power meter reads within the smart trainer. So what you need to do is ride the trainer to get it a bit warmed up and up to its normal kind of operating temperature and then calibrate it. That way you'll get some accurate readings. But in terms of the componentry and the life of it, like I say, the cold isn't going to affect it, but what might have an impact is if any damp or moisture gets inside the smart trainer itself because it could start to corrode any of the metal parts or maybe even some of the circuit board inside. So my advice would be, if you can, move the trainer inside when you're not using it. That way it's in a drier environment and the same with your bike. And then you can just take it outside when you're going to do your workouts and then you don't need to use your fans. There you go. Next question is from Stefan Hansen. They say, hashtag ask GCN Tech. Good work using the hashtag. I've used, or well, I've just purchased my first gravel bike and was wondering, would the bike fit be the same for as a road bike? Thanks. Pretty much, yeah. Um, I tend to set my gravel bike up in a fairly identical position to what I have my road bike. However, there are some small but simple changes you can look to make, which lots of people do in terms of slightly tweaking the position on your gravel bike. Therefore, the things that you could look at are choosing a very slightly wider handlebar, maybe just going up one size, and then moving um, to a slightly shorter stem. This will bring your handlebars a bit closer to you, and also having your handlebars in a very slightly higher position. Now, all three of these changes need to be fairly small, but combine them together, and what you're gonna do is shift your riding position into a slightly more upright and further back on the bike. This is gonna give you a little bit more stability and control when you're riding your gravel bike on loose surfaces. And it should help make it a little bit more comfortable compared to your road bike when you're not riding on loose surfaces and you're trying to be a little bit more aerodynamic. So those are some three little pointers which I would look to change on your setup compared to your road bike. Right, next question is from Nick Van Dam. They say, love your shows. Thanks very much, very kind. I've got an older 2011 Giant TCR and I was wondering how to determine how wide a tire I can safely put on. I know several bikes from that era which can only run 23C tires, um, which is what you always have on your bike. Uh, so the widest tires that are gonna be able to fit into your bike, there is no set way of telling this. There isn't a standard measurement. And the thing you'll also find is depending on what size or brand of tire you use, they do measure all very slightly differently. Like a 28 millimeter wide tire in one brand might be slightly narrower or wider than another brand. And also what you need to take into account is that as you start to choose slightly wider tires, 
the overall circumference of the wheel is going to increase as well. Therefore, you need to check you've got clearance down by where the chain stays, meet the seat tube, and on the seat tube itself. It's not just about that the overall width may be up by where the brake calipers fit. So in answer to your question, unfortunately, there isn't a set number or an amount I can give you, but it's a simple case of trial and error. And if the tire and the wheel combination fits into your bike without it rubbing on any part of the frame, even when you're doing your full gas sprints, then it's perfectly fine to use and I wouldn't worry about it. But what you do need to take into account is just to make sure there is enough clearance for any flex in the wheel or if any leaves or other stuff get caught around in there. So a bit of trial and error, you'll be fine. Next question in is from Steve Klein. They say, hi, Alex, Manon and Ollie. Just me today, sorry. Um, I want to get started on Zwift. My road bike has an Ultegra Di2, oh, has Ultegra Di2, with an 11 to 34 cassette. Do I need to make any adjustments to use the included 11 to 28 cassette on my Wahoo Kicker? Nope, no need to make any changes. Technically, your chain is going to be a little bit longer than what it needs to be, but when you're riding the indoor trainer, it's not going to be the end of the world whatsoever. All you do need to be mindful of is if you start riding in the small chain ring and the small sprocket at the back, then your chain is going to be a bit long and you might find that it's a bit droopy in the middle, but avoid riding those gear combinations and you'll be perfectly fine. I mean, most of the time you're going to be in the big ring on your turbo trainer. Next question is from Paul Collingridge. They say, hi, lovely people. When carrying my bike on the roof of my car, the rack grips on the top tube. But someone has said to me that I need to get a rack that grips via the forks. What are your thoughts, please? Um, take your pick, really. There's lots of different brands and manufacturers of bike roof racks. Some of them by the forks, some clamp by the, the frame of the tubes in different positions. All you do need to be mindful of is if you're using a bike rack which clamps onto the frame of your bike, particularly if you've got a carbon fiber bike, is that it only applies a little bit of pressure onto the frame. Now, most racks made from reputable brands will apply a bit of pressure onto the frame to help hold it in place, and then that locking mechanism will secure to allow it to not go any tighter or any looser. And it's that that is holding the bike securely, not the overall pressure on the frame. Now, if you are a little bit concerned about this, then sure, you could use a rack which mounts the bikes using the forks, and then you haven't got to worry about that whatsoever. But do take into consideration how the clamp system works. Does it use a cam system to apply that bit of pressure, or do you have to wrench it up tight onto the frame? Because those ones that go particularly tight onto the frame are probably what you need to be mindful of. So a little bit of research, and um, with that advice, you should be nice and safe. Next question in is from Matthew Cycling. Hi team, what do you think is the most effective way to cover disc brake pads when applying paint finish protection sprays to a bike? So they've tried a few different things such as tape, aluminium foil shrouds, never heard of that, plastic bags, um, etc. But wonder if you had a hack for this. They say they're not concerned so much about the discs as they remove the wheels from the bike, but it's the brake pads in the calipers themselves. Um, so it sounds like you've tried a few different options there, and what I would do is simply remove the brake pads off the bike. It's normally a fairly simple job, doesn't require many tools, takes a matter of minutes. Take the brake pads out, keep them tucked to the side, out of the way. That way you can use all the products and paint finishing sprays on your bike, get it looking nice and shiny and protected, and then when you're finished, you can just put the pads back into the calipers and you haven't got to worry about any contamination whatsoever. That for me is the easiest solution and there's absolutely no risk of contaminating the brake pads sooner, aren't we? Simple. Right, on to our last question. This week it's from Callum Davis. They say, hi guys, hoping you can get your hashtag nerd on. Um, yeah, we'll try. Wondering what your thoughts are on a disc wheel or a 65 millimeter deep section for the Ironman Wales course. Normally it's a disc wheel all the way, but this is a lumpy course looking to complete the bike leg in five hours and 15 minutes. What oh, good effort that. Um, I would stick to your usual plan of using a disc wheel. I think the aerodynamic advantage that the disc wheel offers over a, a course such as long as five hours is gonna outweigh the slight saving that you could have by using that 65 millimeter wheel in terms of the weight saving. So I haven't worked out all of the different 
um, time savings this could be because it would take a long time and there are a lot of different variables to take into account, most of which I don't know for your exact setup. But overall, stick to the disc wheel because the aerodynamic advantage will far outweigh the small weight saving that you can have by switching to another wheel. And just to double check this, I did um, send Ollie a message yesterday just to confirm and I'll put a little screenshot of our conversation up on screen. Basically, Ollie just said, yeah, 100%. He's like, have I taught you nothing? Um, but basically, Ollie's suggestion is that it's gonna be worth like 0.1 for your CDA, which is a significant saving that you could have. I don't know the exact difference in time saving, but um, stick to your original plan and it sounds like you already know what's best for you. That's it for this week's GCN Tech Link. Hope those have answered the questions that you have. And if I didn't get to your question, sorry about that. And hopefully we'll get to it in the coming weeks, but keep commenting them in the comment section down below and we'll pick them out each week. Right, that's it from me. I'll see you in a bit. Bye.